uh, the first glass in our, uh, of the glass structures and engineering journal. Actually, this is a, a series of, uh, of webinars closely related to, um, uh, to this uh, journal. Next slide, please. I am uh, welcoming you here also on behalf of the full team of editors-in-chief of the, of the journal. Um, you see here uh, everybody present at the, let's say, uh, yeah, the, the Challenging Glass Conference in 2016, when the very first issue of the journal was also presented. From uh, left to right, we have Jens Nielsen from uh, DTU in Copenhagen. Then we have uh, Christian Lauter from the TU Dresden. Uh, I skipped myself and I jumped then to uh, Jens Schneider from the TU Darmstadt. And then Mauro Overend from TU Delft. And uh, my name is Jan Belis. I'm from Ghent University. Um, so far, we have uh, yeah, been quite proud that we have already a full series of, uh, of different uh, issues and volumes of our journal uh, on the table. And if we go uh, to, uh, let's say, to, to look at uh, the different volumes in each year, um, then we see that from the volume uh, one, which we had in 2016, uh, where we had actually two issues per year, we have grown meanwhile to volume six here, where we have uh, uh, for the first time four issues per year. And so we, we have seen a nice nice growth, and you can see also that uh, at some point we uh, we started to uh, to adapt the the cover of the journal so that we have a, a individual picture for uh, for every new issue so that it's a little bit more recognizable okay christian now also quite nice to announce is that we have um, uh, installed some topical issues where uh, we are building an, a full issue around one, one specific uh, topic. Um, the very first one is uh, closed already and will be published already in September of this year. The topic there will be projects and case studies and uh, we are uh, having, uh, let's say, quite some, some very nice and challenging projects which we can present to you. So uh, we are really looking forward to that one. However, we have still another four other um, uh, topical issues in the pipeline. Uh, you can see the titles over there. The topics are glass and circularity, glass and extreme events, glass and design codes, and then finally glass and digital transformation, digital fabrication and artificial intelligence. Um, these calls are open, so you are uh, very welcome to submit an article to one of those topical issues if you're interested. More information can be found on our website uh, with, uh, yeah, with this link. It's actually the homepage of the um, of the journal. Okay, Christian. Now, coming back to these glazinars, what is the main idea? Well, actually, with the editors-in-chief, we have selected two uh, papers uh, which have uh, recently been published in the journal. Um, and uh, we have invited for these two papers, uh, let's say, the, the authors to present their work. And so they will do so. Um, in, uh, after this uh, short presentation, we each time also include a question and answering session. So uh, please, if you have any questions, you can uh, write them either in the, in the chat or uh, keep them uh, to, to ask them uh, live after the speakers have uh, ended. Um, we are planning to repeat this type of glazinars uh, in the same frequency as we do it actually as we are publishing our issues. So that means that we are uh, planning four glazinars per year. Uh, so uh, the next one uh, yeah, will be somewhere in September, but we will um, be talking more about that one later on. Let's get started with uh, the real content of this first glazinar. And um, I give now the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Christian Lauter. Yes, thank you very much, Jan. Yeah, uh, my name is Christian Lauter, uh, Professor of Building Construction at uh, TU Dresden. And I have the honor to introduce the first presenter of today, uh, Stefan Dix, uh, from the University of Applied uh, Sciences in Munich. Uh, Stefan has been active in the field of steel and glass construction uh, for several years already. Um, he actually started his career as an apprenticeship uh, with an apprenticeship as a technical draftsman at Sale in Germany. And then shortly after that started his uh, civil engineering study at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich. 
Um, during his study, he also spent six months in uh, New York to um, to um, work or as an assist uh, assistant site manager for Sale um, to work on the construction of some Apple stores. Also, during his study, he already uh, started working at the uh, laboratory for steel and light metal uh, construction, LSL, at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich, uh, where he now is a uh, research assistant. Um, in that role, he performed his PhD study um, under the joint supervision of uh, Christian Schuller from the University of Applied Sciences in Munich. Uh, and with co-supervision of Stefan Kolling uh, of the University of Applied Sciences, uh, Mittelhessen in Gießen. Um, the topic of his PhD is methods for the evaluation of op optical uh, anisotropy effects in tempered glass. And that's actually also the topic of the presentation today. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen so you can start up your screen, uh, Stefan. Perfect. And then the opportunity Thank you, again Christian, to remind for... the audience to submit questions uh, in the chat. And then after the presentation, uh, Jens Nielsen will pick up, pick up these questions uh, to uh, post them to Stefan Dick. Yeah, yeah. Hope, thank you very much, Christian, for the very nice introduction. Hopefully everybody see my screen now. Yeah, right, okay, then can we go? Okay, perfect. My topic here is digital image processing methods for the evaluation of optical anisotropy effects in tempered architectural glass. And, oh, sorry, I have to scan my, minimize this. Oh, and no, not really. Sorry. Um, I want, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. First of all, but what are optical anisotropy effects? First, um, tempered glass is popular because of the higher strength and are often used for highly stressed glasses. Um, they are showing some optical effects which are caused by minor inhomogeneities in the hardening process, and which leads to the perception of white um, and black and sometimes rainbow-like spots in the, in the facade, in the glass. As you can see here on the left image, um it's it's more like uh, a strain pattern here and uh, as a strain strip pattern on the uh, on, on the right picture and the problem is that currently there are no normative regulation of the assessment of of these effects and they are as characteristic in tempered glass and not declared as defect but um we have some problems with them, and we 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 showed in our experiments we can measure these effects with the help of photoelasticity, and we have the chance to quant quantify these anisotropy effects on basis of the RGB photoelasticity. We use two different setups: one small polaris polariscope setup, and one um, polariscope setup for larger glass glass panes. Um, we use our uh, calibration sequence where we first perform a calibration on these setups um, with a Babini Isolé compensator. We already published this sequence before. Um, it is already published by Markus Ilgood and Christian Schuler from our university um, in 2015. And the method is based on the RGB photoelasticity from Ayu Valaset. And it goes with, we have the isochromatic image in the polariscope and we correlate the, um, the color of the image with the retardation values we get from our Babini Soleil compensator. And therefore we can determine um, the retardation out of these tempered glass panes. We, in our experiments, we use um, two different setups. We have eight glass samples with different thickness, with thickness of six millimeters, sh are shown here, and with 12 millimeter glass samples. It's also with different sizes. We have the size, the dimension um, on the smaller samples with one by one meters, and the larger samples have dimensions of one by three meter. 
and we we did some photoelastic um, images where we measure the retardation out of the tempered glass panes. Um, it are shown as um, as false color plots. These false color plots are scaled in um, in, a, in a scale from zero to 250 nanometer, and the blue and dark um, areas are in under 50. And you can see if it goes higher, we have here in these um, glass panes we have nearly 200, 250 nanometers, which lead in the facade um, through um, through through. Um, Interreference colors, which are white, uh, white colors, and th they will be definitely visible for the observer. So, in our experiments, we have eight different glass samples, as I said, and our goal was to use different digital image processing methods to evaluate these glass samples. Um, so, we have three different um, methods. The first method are statistic. The first two methods are, are methods which are already used in so-called anisotropy scanner, which are at the end of a tempering furnace and measure and, and do some retardation measurements all the time for every glass pane. So these two methods are statistical methods where um, the where we evaluate maybe a mean value or a um, we always um, um, evaluate the 95% quantile value, um, which means that 95% of, um, of the um, shown value for this example, 185 nanometer, are below, are be, are below 95% of the area are below 148 nanometers. And in contrast to the statistical methods, there are a threshold methods on the market already or used in these anisotropy scanners, um, which means that they define a threshold value, for example, 75 nanometers as optical retardation. Um, and therefore, they um, say, okay, we have the threshold of 75 um, nanometer. At this point, every pixel who are above are greater than 75 nanometer um, will go are white pixels and the black pixels are beneath 75 nanometers. Um, it's always uh, both methods are used and we in our experiments and our evaluation we uh, used a third method. It's called the texture analysis. The texture analysis has the advantage that they can um, they are also called um, statistics of second order. They can use the um, the relation and the, the distribution the, of the uh, retardation um, over the area. They can measure um, the distribution of the. They can cluster. They can measure the homogeneity. There, there are some futures who can measure the homogeneity of the retardation over the over, over the area so far they can determine if the, the image the anisotropy effects are um, and the and the retardation are homogeneous in the image or do we have a, a cluster of high retardations and so far and so therefore they they can be used for, uh, they can be used to to um, evaluate the pattern in an image. So in our evaluation, first of all, we propose um, evaluation regions um, here as an example, as you can see on the left um, image, we have an isochromatic image um, of a glass pane, of a tempered glass pane of one of our samples. And we, we divided these into different zones. Because, as you can see, at the near the edges we have higher retardations um, shown as these white, white areas, which influence the evaluation. And my paper I showed this in Table Two that we've got here um, 
a huge scattering for the for the um, quantile value evaluation. Um, we have a, um, a, a huge scattering. We have so we decided in our in our evaluation that we only evaluate the evaluation zone M. In the next part of my paper, um, a part of my paper was that we want to um, discuss and um, investigate the influence of texture analyzers because um, texture analyzers is scale dependent. So our first goal was to normalize the sites on reference areas. So we have an original image which maybe has the size of 2000, 2500 by 2500 pixels. And we, um, we introduced a reference area of maybe um, in different sizes. And on this reference area, we get a scale independent, now we can do a scale independent um, evaluation. We tried different sizes. Um, we tested four different sizes and scaled the images um, by the K nearest neighbor algorithm of MATLAB. And by applying texture analysis, we discovered that the scaling has hardly no influence of the statement of the texture analysis. And there is enormous speed up of the calculation time um, through image size reduction. So therefore, it was a nice uh, discovery. And also we discusses the effect of GLCM setting. GLCM is the basis for texture analysis. And the building of this GLCM has an influence. So you have different settings. Um, and one of the settings are the distance. And the distance has a major influence on the um, on the textural features and therefore on the evaluation results. So in our paper, we um, we we are given our, a procedure or a flowchart of our calculation algorithm, where we said, okay, we have to load our recitation image, setting the evaluation area, normalize the area on the reference area, create the GLCM, and do the textural features and determine the textural features. We also give our recommend GLCM settings um, because we, we recognized um, we have to do this because um, in other case, we get totally, um, totally uh, different um, results. In our final evaluation, we have these eight temperate glass panes of different thickness and with different uh, patterns and as a tropic patterns and different validations over the area. We in our file, we divided the evaluation per thickness in six millimeter and 12 millimeter glass panes. And for six millimeter, the isotropy value with the threshold uh, method um, cannot distinguish between um, different optical qualities because as you can see, the 95% quantile value shows us that um, for for um, for um, for a thickness of six millimeter, we have um, values between 30, 43 to 60 nanometers, and therefore it is um, in the future an adaptation of the threshold or multi-threshold method would be useful um, for instead of uh, using only 75 nanometer. Um, the th the, in the evaluation of the thick um, glass panes, we we also um, figured out that w we have we can do we can distinguish between good and low quality, very good because um, these two glass panes um, ha has really high retardations and the evaluation criteria are. Can, can distinguish between good and low quality for for every thickness and the global criteria, sorry. The so global criteria, 95% quantile value and the textural features can distinguish really good between good and low quality. And 
only, as I said before, the isotropy value has um, um, has a weakness on the on the thin glass paint. The summary. Um, in our paper, we show that anisotropy effects can be quantified with the help of the photoelasticity. The paper presents three different digital image processing methods to evaluate retardation images. Um, we define and suggest evaluation zones because um, if you do not use them, you um, falsificate the results. And we showed that global evaluation methods neglect the special distribution of the retardation values and the, the pattern of the anisotropy. And we also showed that it's really important that you know the setting for the calculation of the GLCM because it has a great influence on the text on the results of textural features. And the paper presents a procedure for implementing a fast and scale independent texture analysis of retardation image. And therefore, a, a method, a additional method, which can be used in anisotropy scanners. Our outlook and further research, for the research is um, we, we do some ongoing investigations on a large number of different glass samples. We know that the eight glass samples are, samples are not enough for um, to give uh, uh, um, uh, a good uh, to, uh, to define or to, to define an ev evaluation criteria for an, a standard. So we do the, so we do um, un ongoing in investigations. And also we do some investigations on our outdoor test facility. Um, we have we want to correlate the measurement results and the visibility of the anisotropy effects in a huge in a huge investigation study. And our goal is, is the reduction of anisotropy effects and, and of course the improvement of the optical quality of temperate glass in the future. Also, at the moment, um, we are writing a standard for the evaluation of optical effects. Um, it's planned as Dean Spec Pars, uh, and we hopefully in one year have a standard to evaluate um, anisotropy effects. Um, thank you very much. It was a really short and quick, um, um, quick presentation. Hopefully, everybody. Has an overview get to, has get an overview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm, yeah. Before I well, first of all, thank you for your for your very interesting presentation uh, on a topic and, I I believe yeah. is a major concern for many designers and and people working in the glass industry. Um, before I open this digital floor for questions, uh, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Jens Nielsen, and I'm one of the editors, as, as introduced by Jan. Um, I'm an associate professor from Technical University of Denmark, and I'm primarily working with numerical simulations and the use of glass as a structural material. Um, having introduced myself, I guess we have some time for, for a few questions. To, to Mr. Dix, so please uh, put questions in the chat or, or somehow indicate that you would like to, to raise a question, yeah. then we will see if we can get the technical stuff to, to work yeah. and allow I'm, you to speak. Yes? I'm very sorry, but it's, it's so much input and it's hard to, to get on in 10 minutes. So hopefully everybody get a good overview and... Um, and For sure. Yeah, it's it's not easy to. Anyway, while people are thinking a little bit, I would I I have a a, a single question, uh, which perhaps is pulling a little bit in my own uh, interest direction, of course. Um, of course. But if if I understand you correctly, then your contour plots are actually providing kind of an uh, relate somehow to the to the residual stresses in the glass. So the That's retardation right. and residual stress. And yeah. and perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on this relation and perhaps comment on the possibility to extend this 
uh, investigation you're doing in order to not only looking for the optical quality but also for the tempering quality would it be able to use the same procedure the same method in order to say something about the the tempering quality is it is what what are the variations in the residual stresses and so on um yeah um the thing is that the, what what you see in the in, in the retardation measurements it is um it is the difference of the of the residual stresses um, of uh, the principal direction in the principal direction sigma one and sigma two the difference and um, it has to be a combination of as these retardation measurements in quality control um, gives the glass supplier or processor uh, a, a, a tool to 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 get a better glass and to to get a better process because and um, for the area for the in for the homogeneous area he, he can see if the, if some heater or some quench nozzle is blocked or something else so he can he can really quick um, see oh something has changed changed in my process the thing is on the other side you cannot on these images you cannot see if um, if, if if you have the right tempering level because mm. it's only a difference on these two principal stresses but there are other methods maybe um, some uh, one method is to to measure the edgeman edgeman brown stress um we have um, in 2017 we have a, a paper in in the glass bowl where we where we presented that we can measure um, the edge membrane stress and can correlate it to um, surface compressive stress. And the mm -hmm. correlation, and, and if you have a co correlation to surface compression stress and the edge membrane stress can be measured during the process by these retardation measurements, then you have a tool to have um, to, to, to assess your tempering level and to uh, to assess your quality of um, uh, in the future, like um, bending strength, and also right, because bending stress correlate with um, surface compressive stress, and bending and also slightly correlate with the braking pattern. Yeah. So our goal is to get all um, the anisotropy in my in my dissertation, but we also have the goal that we or the aim that we um, to include um, edge membrane stress measurement in as a quality instrument for uh, the evaluation of uh, tempering level and, okay. and so for you yeah, sorry uh, <laughs> thank you a long um, explanation <laughs> uh, no that's that's good thank you um do we have any questions from from uh, from the audience, I, I I don't know if 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 it's me who can't see anything, but but yeah. there doesn't seem to be any questions. No, no, there are several actually, Jens, uh, in the questions okay. part. Yeah, if you cannot see them, maybe I can uh, I can yeah. go through them. Yeah, Please, it's in the question, because I... it's in the questions part and not in the um, in the chat. In the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I okay I can't. Ah, okay. I can only see one line at the time in that. If you can, if you can, uh, maybe I can do something here. Ah, here. Ah, yeah. Now I see something. <laughs> um, oh, there's actually a couple of of questions here. Perfect. Uh, so, so the first question here is from um, uh, from here. Uh, from Sophia Stangel, I hope I pronounced it correct. So she asks if if this uh, optical effect influenced the transparency of the glass panels, um, or do they uh, simply influence the optics of the buildings? Um, so I, I guess you, yeah. Um, yeah, um, we have to mention that these optical effects are, are visible under certain light conditions 
and the, it also it appears on the facade because it it's a uh, it's an image who is uh, is a sum of different panels and all, so, so you can see different um, patterns over the over anisotropy patterns over the facade but we have to mention that it is um, an optical effect which is only visible on certain light um, light conditions and these light conditions um, are um, are really raw and it depends on which angle you are, are standing at which angle the observer is looking on the facade and it depends on um, which um, what time is it how is that how is the sun to the how stands the sun to the facade and there are a lot of um, criteria, and we have a guideline if you are interested Sophia we have a guideline from the FKG uh, from the Fachverband uh, Konstruktiver Glasbau, um, where we have a lot of information about um, anisotropy effects. And I, I think that's a good start to get into this topic. Yes, thank you. I think I will just uh, pick some of the questions, uh, a few more, and then, then I think we, we also need to move yeah. on. Uh, but there is there is uh, one asking here if it's... If it's uh, possible to do this for a uh, thicker laminated glass um, so if you have 48 yeah. to 60 millimeter thick laminated glass laminated with SGP for instance would would, yeah. would you be able to do this for, for that type of glass as well um, yeah but you have to um, um, there are different methods out there different anisotropy scanners on the one side who have a, a um, uh, a set uh, a range who is limited to um, maybe 150 to 250 nanometers and therefore they cannot measure um, um, VSG or a laminated glass this method we used in this for, for in, in this in this paper we used the RGB photoelasticity so we have a uh, have a larger um, a larger retardation range we can measure till 1000 um, nanometers so we can measure a re um, retardation in laminated glass and we had has uh, had also performed some um, some investigation in this topic but the normal anisotropy scanner which you can buy can buy ha um, has not the range to measure it and, and I think uh, a last one, and then then perhaps if you have time, Stefan, afterwards you can you can write uh, answers in in, of course. in in for these questions. Um, but but I think it's a short one. Uh, but does this method also apply for for curved glass? Um, curved glass is a little bit more special because you have some restrictions on curved glass. You have to we have used it for curved glass already. Yeah, it works, but there are some. Um, um, but you have to to um, to to to, um, to think about it because um, if um, the curving has and the the light which travels through the glass is important. If you have an angle, um, then then you get um, other results. So you have to know, okay, is it a, a low curved glass or is it a strongly curved glass? Strongly curved glass, like 90 degrees, it's not, it's not possible. And there is already no scanner who, which can scan curved glass. Okay. No. Thank you so much. I think we, we need to move forward. And I think uh, Jens Schneider is going to present the next speaker, if I remember correctly. Is that true, Jens? I think so. If you say yeah. so, it must be correct. <laughs> you're, you're a professor. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jens. Uh, and um, I want to present our next, next speaker. And um, uh, thanks you also. Uh, thanks again, Stefan, for that presentation. But now we come to, to the next speaker, which, uh, who is Stefan Feierabend. And uh, Stefan Feierabend um, is well known in the class community, I believe. Um, he he uh, originates from University of Stuttgart and then also worked at di uh, different um, uh, different locations in the context of 
of uh, glass. I think um, you you well known um, um, the uh, Werner Sobeck's office, and um, he's he's today uh, especially presenting a very interesting project of renovation of, of the tower here in Frankfurt, which is close by. Stefan is a real expert on the glass business, I think. Um, he has been working in the field, um, I think, something like 15 years now. And Stefan also um, has this, this, this mix, what I like very much, between practice and um, also the theoretical work. So he, he's, he's currently a professor in um, Stuttgart at the Hochschule für Technik, which is the University of Applied Sciences in um, Stuttgart. And I think um, the, the, the revisiting that um, Messeturm in, in Frankfurt is a very interesting project. And I believe that we will find um, very large glass panels now in the next talk. So Stefan, I don't know, I, I was a little bit confused because of how to join on the, on the panel. Now I'm in and I don't know if you are in already, I hope so. And if you're Thank in you then... Much. That and I can just hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jens. Yes, so hopefully you can hear me and I'm in. Um, and I would also like to share my screen. I hope you can see that. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. So thank you for your kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity that we can present our project to you. We, though there are several ones who worked on that project, of course. Um, and you can also find the paper in the journal. We, these are my colleagues uh, Florian and Roland from Werner Sobeck. You mentioned Werner Sobeck already, and we are a structural and facade design working on this project together with my former colleagues at Sealy, Stefan and Peter. And we together um, made this paper and we're happy to share it with you. The Messeturm, I think, is quite well known. It was the highest building when it was built in 1991 in Frankfurt, located by the famous architect Helmut Jahn, who unfortunately passed away uh, 10 days ago. He had an accident with his bicycle in Chicago, and unfortunately, he died in that accident. It was his project in 1991, and it was, again, once again, his project right now. Um, there's an adjustment on this building to the, uh, to the requirements of a modern office building. So after 30 years, so that it's still, let's say, a very iconic building for Frankfurt. Um, it has been opened in 1991 and the general contractor was Hochtief, but the facade and the facade we are focusing today on is the, the lobby facade, which was done in that time by Gardner as contractor. The entrance facade is approximately 17 meters high and 24 meters wide. And this was adjusted and is almost finished. But this is the view which we found a few years ago. This very sophisticated facade with glass fins in the 1991 uh, by Gardner's. And this was transferred um, because they wanted to change the lobby as well. Um, in former times, uh, the lobby was the way to get to the elevator's core and get up to the offices. Nowadays, um, such a space, you see here that the footprint of the, of the, of the tower, it's about approximately 40 by 40 meter. And um, we have, it's symmetrically, so we have four curved facades, which have been, in the older version, uh, a radius of 20 meters. And to enlarge that space for, for, let's say, an area where you meet a lounge character, where you can have a coffee, where you can have exhibitions, night events, um, it was passed four meters further out. So it was pushed out, this facade, all over to create more space. And that was the rendering how it should look like. And as mentioned before, we used, uh, let's say, oversized glazing to, to realize this. So you can see the image, how it 
should look like. Um, the architect, once more, was Helmut Jahn. And the design phase, you can see uh, three years approximately. And it's currently under construction, almost opened. And there was a bit of a delay due to all the circumstances in the last uh, years, you know. And we, Werner Sobek, did the structural and the facade design of that building. And Seeley was the contractor for the lobby facade. The glass I'm talking about was uh, the glass supplier was CDEC for the exterior glazing and the interior glazing comes from Sunglass. Um, to have a very transparent building, the article is maximum transparency. So we were focused on the, the load, the minimum loads, which governs, and therefore wind tunnel testing was performed by Walker engineers. You can see here the, the tower and especially the facade here at the bottom in the channel. And you can see here that the, the black points on that uh, footprint and few of these are the pressure tapes in that model to determine the wind loading scenarios, the realistic wind loading scenarios, and then apply it to the, this uh, model. This was a sophistic model for the finite element uh, modeling of the structure. Sorry. And in principle, it's a very simple system. It's a three hinge, as a frame with three hinges, which you can see here in blue, which is supported by, let's say, a V-shaped substructure, which is hidden by a suspended ceiling. So in the end, you only see those um, frames, pin connected elements, stainless steel, which is building the substructure for those glazing elements I'm gonna talk about. Um, the roof is built out of a T-profile stainless steel. Um, and the facade, it's a T-profile, the, the roof and the facade fins are trapezized and also tapered. So they have a depth of 120 to 360 millimeters tapered over the height, and the height is approximately for the for the fins, 17.5 meters. So quite large. And if we look at the steel, you cannot order 17.5 meter long stainless steel trapezized out of the catalog. You have to, to fabricate this, and this was fabricated by Sele Pilsen. You can see here uh, welded joints, so it's put together by butt joints uh, of three parts and milled in several steps and then polished and made perfect for the client. There was a high quality um, aspect on this. Here you can see uh, the fork at the bottom for the pin connection for this fin profiles. And here the finish polishment where you can even better see here uh, the pin connection and then the tapering over to 360 millimeter steps in the middle and the ones again to 120 on the top side. Um, there's also glass, glass of course. Um, we have um, very large panels. The size of these insulated glass units for the vertical facade is 17 meters by 2.8 meters. And there are approximately, and not approximately, there are exactly 36 of them, um, which uh, brings us to a total area of 1,800 square meters. And these are huge, huge units, and they are heavy. They're, they're approximately six tons per IG unit. Though there's special care during the fabrication, the transportation, and installation, of course, those, those panels. It's not um common to to use such weights and sizes we also have a horizontal glazing not only a vertical glazing because as mentioned the whole facade is stepping out for additional meters so we do have a roof on top creating by those uh, mentioned steel profiles which is also uh, insulating glass both glazing, the vertical and the horizontal glazing is made out of two laminates, both 12 millimeters heat strengthened glass. But there's quite a difference, not only the spacer, 
is a difference. There's also the difference that the, the vertical glazing is also curved. It's perfectly curved and it's not warm banded, it's laminated coal banded. And it is cylindrical, so it has a radius of 24 meters. And therefore the interlayer used here is also sentry glass. And the horizontal glazing as mentioned is therefore different. It's also two laminates out of uh, 12 millimeters heat strings and glass, but the interlayer material was PVB used with those four segments for the roof. It's also fritted, the glass on the, on the roof. And here you can see what, what's, what's cold bending in the laminating process. You put the, the plies together with the interlayer in between, put it on a mold, and then put it in the autoclave and then glue it together under pressure and temperature, and then pull it out of the oven or of the autoclave. And then you have a certain spring back effect, which you have to take into account. The colleagues from Sealy and CDAC um, calculated that to obtain a perfectly 24 meter radius for our, um, for our IG units. But in the glass design, we have to take into account that this is cold bending, which means there is a permanent stress uh, due to this fabrication, uh, permanent stress in the glass, as well as in the interlayer material, which we introduced to this cold laminated bending process. So therefore we had to get some approval by the building authorities in Germany um, it's um, not only for the glazing, as you can see here, we have the, the blue one, this is the vertical glazing of the facade, on four sides, on four edges supported linearly, as well as the roof is on four sides supported. And one of those edges where the, the red horizontal glazing hits the, the vertical glazing, there's no structural element, it's just uh, ceiling, a structural ceiling, which transfers the load between the two parts, the blue part and the red parts, the vertical and the horizontal. So we needed to get improve, uh, approval for, for certain things. First of all, for the vertical glazing, as we use laminated bending and the shear stiffness of this centric glass, which uh, is under stress permanently, for this support condition mentioned that the roof is one of the supports, the roof glazing, as well as the in-plane loading due to this support condition of the dead weight and snow load, which is on the horizontal glazing. The same applies for the horizontal glazing regarding the supports and the in-plane loading, the wind load, which is on the vertical facade, which is transferred in-plane as an in-plane loading to the horizontal glazing, as well as the maintenance load. We also needed some structural silicone sealing approval by the authorities. The structural silicone sealing, to make it more clear, is the connection between the horizontal, almost horizontal, there's a, um, a slope, a slight slope, and the vertical glazing which you can see here is detail where it's connected. These glass units are really huge. You can see that if you place a person in the picture like here, if you just make a picture, you, you would not realize how large those, those units are. But you can, if you look at the vacuum sectors and you can imagine that there's quite, quite a load on and it's quite large and you can, I'll slightly see the curvature. It's, if you look at this edge here, you can slightly see that it's cylindrically curved slightly, and it has just one support, a setting block in the end here in the middle of the glass, which is also already put into place in the, in the, at CDEC in the production line. Then it's all packed together and transported to the side with, here's him with, 
not a special tr with a special truck. It's not a normal truck. And then there comes uh, the very interesting task to turn this 90 degrees, the glass panel. So that was transported in this position and then turned 90 degrees. Six workers were necessary to, to pull this in this uh, 90 degrees position. And then the crane put it over to, to the building where, and this was uh, the second panel which was installed that time. For the first panel, we, we did not invite all the people, but for the second panel, when we know that it will work, um, the press was there, the television and so on. And of course, Helmut Jan, a picture of him, as mentioned, sadly, he he will not be there for the opening it's in summer. Um, we're all watching this very interesting installation of such huge panels from this balcony, which I just showed before. And when the glass panel was put in and you see how transparent it is, you can look through right now because the other facade, I say, I said, I told you that there are four of them very similar to is always the, the old one is demolished. And so you can look through and you can imagine with, if this is also made out of the same glass that it will be very transparent. You can look through this. And it's not only that the people who pass by to the trade fair can look inside, also the people from inside can look outside. So make it really a maximum transparent building. Uh, once back, just to show it here uh, at the top at the roof, this is uh, what you saw in the structural model. This is all substructure um, which will be hidden or which is already hidden by the suspended ceiling. So only this T profile, which is um, heading out to the vertical fin, both with stainless steel is seen and the other one, the other steel is hidden by a suspended ceiling. Here you can see this from below. All is covered. The stainless steel is not, you can only imagine how it will look like. It's all, all it's covered in black foil. Um, yeah, this is the exterior facade, but there comes another one, not only the facade, which was shown right now with the radius use of 24 meters. There's also inside a core an octagon a core, which should be also like a tubular core in the future where the elevator is. So um, there's this second interior facade with a radius of 30 meters approximately, which needs a, a substructure, which you can see on the right-hand side, a substructure which supports this facade. This facade is made out of um, laminate as well but it's it's a warm curved a uh, warm banded gla a glass it's two times six millimeter glass with uh, point fixings and it is translucent so there's a pvb cool white arctic snow in between the two uh, panes of glass and therefore we can illuminate it from behind and give this this lobby a, a very very nice appearance especially in during the night. So you see here the steps during the work for the interior facade. In the end, this interior facade makes up this tube, which is illuminated from behind. Here you can see this interior facade illuminated from behind, not finished in on this picture, but now it's finished. And here outside this very transparent facade of the new exterior facade and here the roof, which I mentioned has glass with fritz on, therefore it's not as transparent as the, the vertical huge IG units. So hopefully this building will be open pretty soon, pretty soon also to the public, the lobby, that you can enter that, have a coffee here at that bar and 
enjoy enjoy life enjoy frankfurt maybe there's an opportunity next time when the the trades are really starting again and people meet and then step by step in and um it was a wonderful project to see this happen to see this happen in germany with such huge glazings and therefore thank you for everybody involved thank you for all the the good work for the team, for the client who was going for this adventure with us. And I would like to thank everybody and thank you to have the opportunity to present this interesting project to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. I think that's a really interesting interesting piece of work and uh, astonishing if you look the development i think it perfectly shows the development in within our field within the last 20 years if you look back what happened and uh, it's it's very inspiring so um jan i think how does it go do you take over for the for the questions or how shall we proceed no jan's uh Go ahead uh, if you have your, uh, your question of your own, otherwise we can have a look at the chat. Okay. I think uh, several questions have, um, yeah, have appeared there meanwhile. Um, I, cannot, I cannot see, uh, I only see the, the old one from the optical effects. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe if you could, because I, when I go to the question mark, I only see Okay, I, uh, maybe I will just then uh, check and, uh, and read the, the, the questions there. There is one from uh, Mihail Istrati. Um, you have mentioned one glass setting block per curved unit. That was his question. Uh, did you carry out any calculations to determine, determine the stresses at the setting blocks? And are all the units uh, supported by one setting block only? What was the rule or standard you have used to determine the number and the dimensions and locations of the setting blocks? Thank you. That is the question from Mihail. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I did not mention it further, but it's um, it's not a typical setting block to make that clear. It's more like a, a bearing device and it's kind of a, a glued on U-shaped steel element in the, let's say, in the during the fabrication, which is then sitting on a real bearing um, on site, and it's only placed or placed, it's only it, the center, it's only placed in the center of the glass pan for the vertical loads. I'm only talking about the setting block for the vertical loading, because to avoid any um, stresses into glass due to deflection of the building, movements of the building, to have it very concentrated just on one point that it can kind of turn without introducing restraining stresses into the glass. And that's the reason why it's just one in the middle. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know, Jens, if you can see the demo meanwhile or otherwise I just continue. Uh, I think it's I think it's better you continue because I, I only see the old questions. I don't know. Okay. And I'm mixing okay. things up here. Is there anything else on this question mark? Oh. I, uh, never mind, Jens. I'll uh, just uh, continue then. So, um, uh, Stefan, there are actually a few questions uh, related to spring back and, and creep uh, in, the, in the curved glass. So, um, yeah, did you consider this? What are the expectations there? Could you please comment on, on the, that topic? Yeah, after the cold bend, uh, the cold bending process during the lamination, um, there's of course when you bring it out of the let's say of the autoclave, and if you get it all off the mold, it will have a certain spring back effect. So you the radius is different. You start with before you laminate to take this into account. This is only a few millimeters the spring back effect, but you have to take it into account. And this was done by the colleagues from Sealy and Cedac calculating that's their business that's it their uh, secret how to determine it perfectly that in the end you get the geometry you really uh, would like to have 
but you have of course considered these stresses also in your glass design so if it's a permanent stress you're introducing so you have to take it into account if you also take the wind loading and so on uh, into your consideration in the design and it's one of many stresses but caused by the process of production and therefore of course the interlayer material centric glass was used and this has had also to be approved by the authorities to use okay. it for this case. okay well you now that you mentioned the centric glass there is also a question from lucio ferretti and he is asking uh, what is the reason for using pvb on the horizontal glazing instead of the centric glass uh, on the verticals We needed the, the centric glass because of the process of this laminated cold bending for the vertical glass and for the horizontal glazing, it was not needed to use. It was more beneficial to, to use PVB. It's insulating glass. It's, it, there are smaller sizes of glass as well in this top roof. And because of uh, climate loading, it's better not to have it too stiff. So there was no need to use centric glass for the horizontal glazing. Okay, that's clear to me. Uh, thank you. Um, then I'm jumping to the question by uh, Alexandre Nonato. He says, uh, okay, um, uh, how about uh, eventual replacement and, and warranty offered by the company in this project? I don't know if you could comment on that one. If um, not, then you well, just can also see. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you can replace the units, of course. It's not cheap to replace a unit, of course, but you can replace them. That's possible. That's the question, if it's possible. No doubt it's possible to replace one, but there, of course, you fabricate a, one more unit, it's low iron glass and the, the whole process and the transportation and the um, yeah the on-site management because I didn't mention that it's very interesting in this project as well because the tower was not closed during this construction phase the the, uh, the, the whole tower the, the office tower was on the service so it was most of the time opened to get access so it was only a, a temporary work from one part to the other part not closed completely okay and if you would like to replace that would be also a challenge to organize this so it's not only the the, the price of the glass itself it's it's all what you have to take into account yes is um in in case of an eventual uh, breakage of a, of one of the panels is there already something uh, pre-produced for for replacement and and stored somewhere or will it be produced then on yeah when in case it is needed only um so far as i know um because it would be there are, let's say the ig units are not all identical because there are openings in for doors so there are let's say a few different kind of or types of IG units used in this project and you do not know which one will break so it would be very very um, expensive to I would assume to to prefabricate this and store this because if you prefabricate the one I'm pretty sure the other one will break the other type will break and you have to replace it uh, but of course this typical 12 meter low iron glass is stored at CDEC yes okay Thank you very much. There are a few small questions left, but um, I would propose that maybe if you could also perhaps have a look at them and, and try to answer them by, by chat, um, because I think we are more or less, uh, well, we have to, to move on also, not to, to run too much uh, beyond our time schedule. So thank you once more, uh, Stefan, for your very interesting presentation and for also answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, then uh, I think we have come more or less to the to the end of uh, our very first Glasinar, and that's of course also a very nice occasion to already announce the the sequel, uh, which is uh, our Glasinar number two. Um, this one will be uh, organized on the the 15th of September, 
um, at the same time of the day as we uh, we uh, did it today. And um, actually, um, in spite of the name Glasinar and the, uh, the journal's name Glass Structures and Engineering, most of next topics will actually not be about glass, but rather about uh, PMMA. So we are going to talk about uh, acrylics, and um, yeah, this will be done uh, both by uh, Marcel Berlinger and by Mr. Graham Colt. Um, yeah, this will be also, let's say, more uh, academic project on the one hand side, and uh, quite challenging, I have to say, uh, real world project also um, yeah, by uh, Mr. Colt. So uh, I hope we can uh, interest you also, and we can expect you uh, also at uh, at that occasion. So then there uh, uh, there is still only one thing left, and that is uh, to thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you uh, again also for uh, all the speakers, um, yeah, both Stefans, uh, for your time and efforts. Very interesting, and we uh, yeah we hope we will see all of you uh, uh, again next uh, September. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.